So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Colin Drury. And Colin has, uh, sorry, while I just try to switch over here. How do I make this go? <laughs> We're all map challenged. Yeah. Colin is a professor emeritus at, um, at SUNY, um, University of Buffalo SUNY, and also as part of the Applied uh, Ergonomics Research Group. Um, Colin has an incredible depth of experience, and um, we look forward to hearing how he sets the stage around uh, this issue. So, Colin, thank okay. you, please. Thank you. I'll leave the uh, laser. Great. I will. Thanks. First of all, I don't think I need a jacket for this. Um, the second thing is about the audience. Um, how many, I don't know most of you, uh, how many of you are from a generally ergonomics background? Wow. How many from a general equality background? Okay. How many from uh, other engineering? Uh, HR? Uh, unions? Trade representatives? Oh, good. So we've got, we've got a good group of people. Um, well, this, the way I was going to talk... <laughs> Okay, yeah, luckily I didn't say anything when the microphone's on. Okay, <clears throat> the, um, what, what I'm planning to do is to, uh, I was told to do conceptualization. I've never been any good at that. I'm better at sort of doing practical stuff, but uh, some concepts are going to come out of this. Um, and so what I really want to do is press the button, okay. Um, human factors and ergonomics, as we've just seen, aims to improve both quality and productivity so it, it, and, uh, and safety. So uh, it's human well-being as well as system performance. Um, the quality movement seeks to improve, eliminate waste and variability, improve system performance generally. Uh, if it helps the human, it's a good byproduct, but it's not sort of written deeply into the objectives. So we've got sort of a little imbalance here. Both sides know something about the other, but not an awful lot. Um, each one of them works on its own. We know that the quality system stuff works, the ergonomic stuff works. Can you all hear if I'm standing back from the mic? Is that okay? Because I could shout louder if you need to. Okay, no, good. Okay, um, so how can we be, do better by being mutually beneficial in this? Um, okay, practical manufacturing example. Uh, do you remember film cameras? In the old days, you used to buy film and take it down to the chemist shop and so on. Okay, well, there was an assembly line, two assembly lines for these in Rochester, New York. One hates to mention names, um, but um, in Rochester. And uh, what we did, um, myself and one of my researchers, um, we were looking at the two assembly lines. One was a very manual line, the other was a partially automated line, a much more modern line. And we went to every workstation on the line. And we measured the good or bad ergonomics. We looked at the body postures and, and so on uh, to give an ergonomics assessment. And then we looked at how long the person had to actually do the job. We know how long they were given because the line was moving. You only got so many seconds. So how much long did you need to move the job? And then we measured quality at the end of every week, which is a standard measure, which you could get back to the workplace. And uh, what we got? More data. Ergonomics is data. Ergonomics is not just airy-fairy ideas, it's data. So we were able to correlate, to regress, to predict the quality, which is, let's see if I press the little button, uh, the errors per week from two things, the time needed and the posture score. The, uh, both positive coefficients, both saying that as these uh, go up, so as the time needed goes up for a fixed time of doing the job, so the time stress goes up, and as the bad posture score goes up, then the errors go up on both lines. And you know, the management said, oh, well, you know, this is a much more automated line, the second line, so it will, you won't find any difference there. And we did. We found it in both places. So the workplaces that have good, uh, good ergonomics and lower time pressure have good quality. And this is a very standard thing. So, uh, okay, I thought we'd gone backwards, we haven't gone forwards. It just looks the same. Um, so, human factors can miss some issues of quality if we don't understand the quality movement. I, I've, I've taught both. I've taught um, 
Six Sigma for years and TQM before that and um, human factors for years as well. So I've got sort of a foot in both camps and I suspect other people have here as well. Um, the quality movement can miss crucial issues as well. Between us, we ought to be able to do better. But what we need to do is say, hey, yeah, where do we come from? What do we believe in this? Um, we analyze, this is a lovely diagram, the next one, it's all in your package, so you don't actually need to read every bit of this. But what we did, we said, okay, where are we? We're at Lean Production, Six Sigma, TQM, going back, Quality Circles, DOE, SPC, all the various bits, how do they fit together? And there has been a gradual movement over the last more or less 100 years. Um, statistical quality controls in the 1920s. It's a long, long time ago. So there's been a gradual movement from these tools as statistical tools used by statisticians into managerial tools used by everyday people getting a job done. And this is an important thing. And I would hope that ergonomics can learn from this as we go along. I think it's important to see where all this has come from. You don't need to read all these now. I say they're, they're in your brochure. So that's okay. We can look at the assumptions of the quality movement. I've put them down. I don't expect you to read them. We just looked at them and said, hey, what do the people in quality, this was uh, Six Sigma or TQM, I've forgotten which, what do people actually believe? And we looked around for the same thing in human factors. We couldn't find any, so we made them up. <laughs> yeah, we know as much about it as other people in the field. Make them up, see if anyone objects. We published the paper 20 years ago. Nobody objected, so I assume we're okay. Um, but um, we looked at the assumptions that, that we have as human factors people and the assumptions the quality people have. And then we get to the real issue, which are the ones that overlap? What I've not done here is put in the things where we don't agree. I put in the things where we do agree. And these, as I see it, are the way ahead for the two movements. I, to I was told to do something on conceptualization, so this is it. Uh, the rest of it is going to be examples. Um, Understand and measure the process. The whole thing is about measurement. Quality is about measurement. Ergonomics is about measurement. Ergonomics comes from two words, ergo, which is work, and nomics, which is putting numbers on things. And so we put numbers on things. So that's a very good point between the two disciplines, that we all believe in data and numbers. So I think this is very important. Um, the second thing, you've got real users. These are not cogs in the machine. These are real people. They are your mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, whatever. They are people who are working there, and you've got to honor them because they are, when you look at it, the large part of a company's worth. If you look at the worth of a company on the stock exchange, and then you look at the worth of all their tangible assets, that's probably 20 30% of the total thing. The rest of it is made up of the brains of the people. That's what the um, real assets of a company are. And we tend to forget this. Use team skills. Very important in all the quality movement, very important in ergonomics. Um, the, the, the whole idea of, of working together with this participative ergonomics has come a long way. We all believe in this. What we don't do very well in the human factors thing is study leadership. We, we assume that we all get together as a group with sort of equal votes and everything comes out. We tend to ignore what is important in the quality movement, which is leaders, people who will push it, champions. And so this is an important thing where we can work together. Uh, allocation of function. This is a technical term in human factors. Um, and what it means is give people jobs that people do well, give machines jobs that machines do well. Don't just give people jobs that you can't happen to automate this week. And so many times you have a semi-automated machine and the human being is feeding parts into this because they can't design uh, a good parts feeder economically. So they put a human there. And then the human gets uh, either bored, injured, fed up, sabotages the place. You know, there are lots of ways in which the human can not improve productivity. So allocate the functions sensibly to humans and machines. Design the human interface well. I'm going to give some examples of this. You know, design it so that it works. It works both physically and cognitively for the human in there. So design the interface between the system and the machine. And the system is a lot more adaptable than the human. So you know, don't force the human to adapt. 
make the machine and uh, do the adapting. Minimize, uh, maximize human beings, uh, human, human well-being as well as performance. Fairly obviously, that's what ergonomics is all about. And to some extent, that's what quality is all about. And I maintain that errors and quality are the ultimate criterion. An injury is an error. Something not delivered on time is an error. Something that has to go back through and be reworked is an error. They're all errors. Get rid of them. You know, this is what we're about. I don't see why ergonomics and quality don't have the same definition. It's all about errors. Uh, I've done most of my work over the last 20 years in uh, aerospace, um, aviation maintenance particularly, and there it's all about errors. The last thing you want is an error being wheeled out of the hangar at 5 o'clock in the morning because that is going to get real, real problems for you. So uh, errors are the, the name of it. Um, there are direct overlaps in here, um, long history of uh, human factors improving quality inspection. In the days when we used to have an inspector at the end of the line, you remember those days? Um, we looked at how well people do it. Now we look at it done offline, the stuff I've done in uh, aviation maintenance, a lot of it is on condition maintenance. You only change this part if you find something wrong with it. So some human plus machine has to go out and find something wrong with it. How well do they do that? We have mathematical models for this. We know how well people do it. They're built into, for example, the design of civil airliners. These mathematical models of how fast cracks grow and how well people can see cracks. It's built in there numerically, so it can be done. Um, we both know about the proper use of statistics. Um, I bet everyone here has had some probability or statistics course in their life. So it's a thing that becomes a common shared knowledge we can use. And we both do experimental design. We know about experimental design. Um, in human factors, we tend to be a bit more old-fashioned. We tend not to use these tiny fractional factorials, Taguchi designs, and so on. But we can do. We just don't. Um, but they are used in, in industry extensively. The other thing in here is human factors is a way of helping us put the quality into the product, know what is important. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, what, what do people think about quality? Not what do I think, but what do people in general think about it? Um, is quality, um, this is me looking at some uh, avocados, um, is, is quality, that's a nice avocado, or is quality, boy, that is really expensive truffles. Um, you know, what are the issues in quality, what do people mean by it? And we've even developed a standard method for testing this and doing it. And let me give you an example of it here. Um, we looked at quality. We said there are really four sorts. General quality, what do people mean by quality? Product quality, what's the stuff coming out at the end of the production line? Service quality, increasingly important. Larger fraction of people are employed in service now than in manufacturing directly. And quality of working life we put in there because that's, I think, very important to you and factors people. And what do we do to find out what people really mean? We want to find the words that describe quality. So we went out and uh, we took 80 people and we read the literature and we found 254 words that people have used or do use to describe quality. We went to people in shopping malls and said, hey, you know, what words do you use to describe quality? And we got all these words, words and phrases and so on, and we put them all down. And then we said, that's far too many, we can't use those. So uh, we took another group of people from shopping malls um, and... Um, we told them, here are 254 words. Would you mind spending 10 minutes with us and telling us how much they're related positively or negatively to quality? And so we took the top 30 words that came out of that, and we said, how are these related to each other? And so we ended up with a good set of rated words that people use to describe quality. And what does it look like? This is what it looks like. We can see dimensions. There are negative dimensions and there are positive dimensions of quality. And these are the actual words that people use that are very strongly related. This lot to durability, this lot to conformance with standards, this one uh, general quality, positive affect, and so on. And this is how each of them is related to the other. So there's a bunch of negative ones here, a bunch of positive ones here. Within here, there are some groupings and so on. So we can now take apart this idea of quality and say, what do real people mean by it? Not what does the engineer mean by it, 
Not what does uh, your boss mean by it when they're looking at the line and saying, that's not good quality. What do the people mean by it? So we can take customers for your product and do exactly the same thing. So we have a, we have a, a good standard methodology for doing this now. We have another one for service quality. Did I get rid of that? I hacked it out. Okay, good. Um, so we've got people's own words for this. We can use it for anything else. We've done studies on uh, airplane cabin comfort using the same methodology. What do people mean by comfort? So I've collected data on transatlantic flights, flying out overnight to Europe, uh, actually attending a meeting when I got there for a day in London and flying back, collecting data on the way back. I'm never going to do that again. You know, that is cruel and unusual punishment. Um, but we, we can do it on all sorts of things. But quality is important. And I want to just give you one more example. I'm not going to show the whole thing here. But there was a thing on surface inspection of car bodies uh, done by Lloyd a while back. Um, and what he and the team did, they were asked to design better lighting for a surface inspection of car bodies. And everyone knows, uh, all the engineers know what are the key issues in here. There are polished scratches and there is orange peel and all these other things, but they didn't do that. They went out to actual customers, buying cars and say, you know, what are the important things? What do you think of the quality of this and the quality of that? They found out the things the engineers were concerned with were not what the customers concerned with. And so what they did, they found out the things the customer was actually concerned with, designed a better lighting system for these, and it worked. They got rid of the quality complaints to surface, surface quality. So there's a lot to defining what quality is in a particular way. And human factors people can help in doing that. Human factors people don't just solve musculoskeletal injuries, as we've seen. They do other stuff as well on the cognitive side. And I think that's important. Okay, enough of the airy-fairy theory. Let's get on to what people do. Um, by the way, in the stuff I handed out, I actually put a 10% Gaussian blur on all the pictures. I didn't know if they were going out in hard copy form or you were going to get a file of them. And I don't like my own pictures wandering around the web, you know, unchaperoned. So <laughs> I blur them. They're on there, so they won't look quite as good on that. Um, I did a lot of work for IBM back in the 80s and 90s, um, and these things on the right here, those boxes are about $10,000 a piece. And every month or so, people would drop them and break them. So what did they do? They put a 50 cent handle on them, nobody dropped them again. You know, this is simple ergonomics, it works. Um, the other one is my example of allocation of function. Behind these glass doors is a um, system for washing the parts that you hang onto this plastic hanger. And so there's a robot in there that picks up this plastic hanger and moves it all the way along. And the handles on here are perfectly designed for the robot. Because if they weren't, the robot wouldn't do the job. Are there handles for the person? No way. Yeah, they can just grab it anywhere. And so people drop them, so they had to actually mold handles for the person on there. But that's that allocation of function again. It's designed for the robot, not designed for the person. Get it designed for both, it costs no more. When you're making the molding, you can do it. Okay, another example for L.L. Bean. This is the only L.L. Bean thing we own, is a, a couple of kayaks uh, with my grandson. Uh, so that's the only slide I've got that says L.L. Bean on it. Um, but this was done back a long way back in the 80s, um, and it was um, Rooney et al. Uh, this is not the Manchester United striker. Uh, this is another one. Um, at a sewing plant. And I want to give you an example now, not of ergonomics going in under, a, uh, under a, uh, an ergonomics banner and improving quality, but quality people going in under a quality banner and improving ergonomics. And this was a sewing plant. I've worked in sewing plants before. Uh, they looked at... Does anyone work in a sewing plant? They're pretty horrendous. <laughs> I hate to say it, but they're, they're not the most ergonomic workplaces you've ever seen. And I've worked with Bass Shoes and Levi Jeans and people like this, and they've made huge improvements over the last 20 years. But they used to be pretty bad. And this was, as you can say, 92, 93, a long time ago. Um, they did an ergonomic analysis on um, a lot of the workplaces as part of the quality improvement system. <clears throat> and what it, is it? It's gone. Okay. Uh, what uh, they find out at the bottom here, 78% drop in musculoskeletal injuries over four years from doing a quality project that included ergonomics. 
So these are important things in there that uh, you can do either ergonomics under a quality banner or quality under an ergonomics banner. Uh, the next one I'm going to leave, this is on Swedish car assembly. That's my son. He assembles Swedish cars. But I'm going to leave that out because other people are covering that. Um, one of the things that keeps turning up in here all the time is this whole issue of time stress and the machine pacing you. And it's so important in manufacturing. Um, it's also important in things like call centers where people are monitored. You've spent 47 seconds with that customer. You're only allowed to spend 45 seconds with that customer. You know, there is this time stress that goes on. And what does it do? Um, you can see here uh, that is quality going down the drain. Uh, if that person doesn't stack the uh, boxes fast enough on the pallets, they fall down. Um, and that does them no good at all. Um, so unless you change the system itself, then if you push people harder, the quality will go down. Now, there are lots of places where you can work faster and you can work smarter, but it means changing the system. If you don't change the system and just dial up the speed, then the errors will go up. No way around it. So instead of giving you examples of this speed accuracy trade-off, as it's known, from ergonomics, I'm going to give you a much bigger example. Um, and this was uh, NASA. You remember the faster, better, cheaper missions from NASA? Uh, it was a big thing back in the 90s. We will go faster, better, cheaper. And the joke inside NASA was faster, better, cheaper, choose any two. Um, but this was the philosophy that went there. And somebody at the Rand Corporation actually did a really good study of this. And what they did uh, was they used a complexity index for all of the missions that had been done. And I'll, rather than go through it, I'll just show you the picture. <clears throat> Along the bottom is how complex the uh, satellite or planetary mission or whatever it was. So it goes from the very low complexity to the very high complexity. And then they looked at the development time in years. As you'd expect, the more complex missions take longer to develop. So this is their legacy data. This is the baseline data of NASA before they did the faster, better, cheaper missions. And then Bearden, who did this, this work for Rand Corporation, did exactly the same thing with the faster, better, cheaper missions and plotted them on the same graph. And here they are. And the green ones are the ones that worked. And the red ones are the ones that didn't work. So what it's saying is the ones that are in red are down at the bottom right. They don't have enough development time for the quality. So if you've got enough development time, you can make the quality. Um, if you don't have enough development time, the missions don't work. Now, these are large, expensive. This is sort of system-level stuff. This is like looking at different nations in terms of their productivity and their, um, uh, sorry, in terms, yeah, their productivity and their death rates. Same sort of macroergonomic data. But it's important. It's relating what happens to the human beings inside it in terms of quality when you're pushed too fast. Um, service quality is another large piece on this. I'm not going to go over this because it's not really appropriate in this meeting, but there's been superb work done over the last 20 years, mainly in Sweden, uh, on, product quali uh, on service quality. We can measure it. We know how to measure it. We've got good uh, ways to do it. We know how to do it. One of the things that's going to impact people in manufacturing is manufacturing is going to look more like service. As we customize manufacturing, as we get rid of levels of middle management, then the people who are doing the actual manufacturing are more likely to do things like interact with the customer. That's scary, but it's coming. This is, this is the way it's coming. Um, manufacturing is going to, in the future, look more like service. Let me give you a, another example here. I'm just going to give another couple of examples. Um, documentation. Um, many, many jobs, particularly maintenance jobs, are done with a uh, task card that you follow. There's documentation, there's a procedure, and when you look at injuries, accidents, errors, procedure not followed is one of the big ones all the time. And 
it's important to see how well the procedure is designed to see why it is or isn't followed. And uh, we work with one of our airline partners. Um, <clears throat> They uh, had to develop a new inspection task card uh, because uh, the FAA had suddenly issued an order saying you've got to inspect the, well, it's, it's a longer time ago now, uh, the uh, tail of uh, 737s in case of rudder hard over. That's what I, I didn't describe it at the time, but I can now. Um, and uh, what they found was if you look at these jobs um, as they were done, if you looked at the finished, signed-off worksheets, you found that 1.5% um, of the responses were in error, but there were something like 15 responses required on each of the task cards, so something like 20% of the tasks had one error or more. You can't live with an error rate of 20%. You can't really live with an error rate of 1.5%. But 20% really set the hattles up on the people at the FAA, and they said, what's going on? So we actually looked at it, and we took these work cards apart, and we said, for each of the steps in the work card, how well are they designed? Do they fit with a set of documentation design guidelines that we developed like 10 years earlier that we should be using for how to design good documentation that works? And what we found with the error rates, oh, there's a little bit mixed up here, 0% when the guidelines were met, uh, this is for each item, 2.3% where the guidelines are not met. So if you meet the ergonomics guidelines, you get rid of the errors. This is nothing to do with training, motivation, uh, taking a person's license away because they didn't do the right job right. This is to do with designing the job card so that it fits the person. And you eliminate all the errors if you design it right. So this is, again, powerful stuff. It says down here at the bottom, the thing we always say, Fix the system before you start exhorting people and training people. You can't train a way, you can't use a software solution for a hardware problem. If you've got something wrong with the system, you can't train your way around it and be effective in the long term. Okay, I'm going to go through this. This is the stuff we did for the space shuttle. You don't need that at present. You can read it later, but it's again about documentation. A um, couple more things in here. Uh, in fact, I'm going to leave this one as well. Two of the more recent interactions that, that have been done on this that, that we've been involved with. Um, one of them is on statistical process control. Wonderful stuff, really great. The idea is that if you uh, take measurements of the process, you can find when it is going to perhaps start producing defects. You don't look for the defects and eliminate them. You look at the process to find out when it's got a chance of producing defects and you eliminate that set of conditions. Great idea. When you do this in practice, I'd noticed this for years, and the person I worked with, Harrison Kelly at um, General Motors, had noticed the same thing. What happens is that these systems de-evolve over time. Someone comes in, trains everyone to use them, trains the managers, um, trains the users, trains the operators. You go around, you talk to the people who are doing the job, and you say, well, what are you doing? Well, we're doing this calculation. Why do you do this calculation? So we can plot this point on the curve. Well, when you plot this point, what do you do with it? Well, I don't know, we give it to management, they want it. And you talk to management and you say, well, what are they doing? Well, they're plotting this point on the curve. Why? So they can control the system better. But they're not using it to control the system. They're using it because somebody at a customer has said, you've got to do it. And they're doing it. And the whole thing becomes a meaningless ritual. <clears throat> this would even give some religions a bad name in terms of meaningless rituals. It doesn't work as it's supposed to because people are just following the letter of what they're doing, not understanding what they're doing. And you can design better systems that allow people to do a better job with this than the standard SPC charts. So remember it. SPC, I'm hoping it's working in your organization. It certainly wasn't in the organizations we worked in. Another thing that turns up in here is lessons learned programs. These look like the greatest thing because the idea of a lessons learned program is that <clears throat> you've got something for nothing. It's like big data. You collect all this data, put it together, and you get meaningful insights. And you can learn a lot from lessons learned programs. But some of them are effective and some of them are not effective. We did a large analysis uh, for the nuclear industry mainly in this, but it works in other industries. 
And what we found was that they're not always effective because people have tried to get rid of the human in the system and substitute a piece of software. Oh, if we get everyone to fill this form in and then send out the results to everybody, then we don't need a human in here. But if you have a human in there saying, oh, I know, this will apply to Fred's work. It's important because Fred's been doing this for years and um, this might be really exactly what Fred needs to do that job. They can do that. Algorithms aren't up to that yet. So again, it's allocation of function, giving people things that people do uniquely well and you get very good results. Give human jobs to machines, it may not be as good. Particularly give machine jobs to humans and it's a bad job. Okay, so where does it leave us? Um, we've got examples in here. I've given a few of the examples of human factors, uh, variables affecting quality of the product or quality of service. So we know they're related. The rest of the day, you're going to see some wild examples, really good examples, because I've read through all the slides. And it's going to be really good. They're going to get a lot more examples. Um, they're not necessarily mutually beneficial unless we go out of a way to make them so. Otherwise, you get an ergonomics department sitting here, a quality department sitting there, and they don't talk to each other all the time, and particularly, they don't work jointly. And if you have them working jointly, you're going to get much, much better results. And the thing about variability at the bottom, um, it's uh, a thing that we do need to deal with, this idea that variance is sin, um, and yet humans like some variability in the job. How do we reconcile these? But again, that's as possible, but that's fairly minor in this context. Let's work together. What we need to do is build bridges between the two sub-disciplines here, the two things that are supposed to serve management. And they don't always serve it as well as they should together, but we can if we do it better. Okay, thank you. Um, Industrial engineers get training in humans. But other forms of engineers, at least in Canada, get almost no training whatsoever in the human. Um, what's it going to take? And that seems to be part of our problem, I think. What advice have you got for us in terms of trying to overcome that, overcome that gap in your experience? Uh, I think if you look at, back at this to academia and say, why aren't we training our engineers to know all this stuff anyway? Um, it's not respectful. We try and cram an awful lot into our curriculum. Um, I know that uh, mechanical engineers uh, would never give up thermodynamics. I mean, they're going to cling to this like um, Americans cling to their guns. Um, so this is a, uh, a thing that we have got to, if we want to put human factors into there, we really do need to say what we take out of somebody else's curriculum. And I think that's important, and I'm not sure we've always addressed this. Um, we think human factors is important. Most industries now think human factors is important. Many of the better industries have human factors groups, ergonomics departments. Um, so uh, there is no reason it shouldn't be in there. Um, but again, it's not the level of respectability of differential equations. Um, I don't see why it shouldn't be. And if you want mathematical stuff, we can do mathematical models as well as anyone else. Um, but it's... Uh, it is a bit of a sell getting over that in academia to train engineers better. Um, so I honestly think that um, we can probably do a better job when people end up in the same industry uh, working together to teach them what they need then than we're likely to have change in the whole academic practice of, of how we train engineers. I hope that doesn't sound too defeatist. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and, I, you know, I think at times I think we suffer from some of the same problems in the ergonomics education that we provide people. Do our ergonomists understand the engineering processes? Do they understand design? Do they understand, can they speak quality? You know, have we trained our, our young ergonomists to do that? And quite often, uh, quite often I think the, uh, the answer to that is no, uh, or at least there's room to improve. Um, again, I'm going to draw your attention to our questions. Okay, please reflect on these as we go through. This is what we want to come back to and what we want to hear from you about, uh, really with each speaker in terms of how we, uh, uh, how we engage in this. Richard wants to make a comment. We have a question? Oh, thank you, Margo. Please. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually just going to address sort of a bit what Colin said and what you just said now of the gap of ergonomists. Um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why 
forgotten this more about quality, depending on what industry you end up doing most of your work in, that might not be the right word. So I work more in oil, gas, petrochemical. And for the production teams there, the words are operability, maintainability, constructability. That's what's going to make get you in the door. Right. In you know, some of the areas you guys work in, it's going to be quality. What I heard with the airline industry, it's going to be errors. So somehow, I, I don't know how we make that leap into that industry specific stuff from our education, but that's a gap that has to be filled somewhere along the way as well. Yeah, th thanks for pointing out that a lot of these issues are context sensitive, and I think uh, it changes again when we start to move into healthcare as well. As well. Um, did you want to? Uh, yeah, comment? just as a thing on that, ergonomists are a quick study. You know, we can go in to an industry, and I've done it, and in a day, we can be actually helping people who've been there 25 years do their job a bit better. That's, that's amazing. You know, because we learn processes. I, I know about every coating process you've ever seen because it's a big thing in Buffalo. Um, you learn to go in. I think what we need to teach people is how to understand the technology and the process. Not here is garment manufacturing, here is automotive, but learn how to understand the process. And if we can teach people how to do that, which we do in internships and so on, uh, I think we're ahead because we're always going to be going into an industry where we don't have any knowledge of that process and we've got to learn quickly.